and is it going well or are you guys still having a problem understanding the challenge or the implementation okay that's nice uh, it's going good i guess in, uh, in our group but we have we faced some implementation problems especially in the extracting the extracting logos part uh, extracting from the video or uh, both should both will apply i guess like from the image to like most of them have the logo the, in the assets folder but after we somehow extract all the images from the video like if uh, the particular game id doesn't have logo in the assets image it's going to be really hard to actually search for that logo if the assets don't have a logo yes 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 uh, uh okay so, so uh, are you extracting the images or the logos from the videos or from the assets directory uh we we i i think like well the required part is like the location of the logo right like yes. not the actual logo file yes so like uh, in order to do that we need the logo from the asset file right mm. yeah so some 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 of the assets don't have like the logo inside they don't have actually the logo png okay okay uh, can you not extract that from the video's image itself uh, instead of going to the assets directory how can we just uh, yeah that was the issue we we have we faced like how how can we extract specifically the the logo is there a way to do that uh okay i mean at least you after getting the image the specific image the the, the first the start image in the, the in the image uh you can at least not exactly the logo but the header you can extract the header text right Yeah, we can extract the text there. So based on those, uh, okay. I think my session is going mostly going to be focused on the content. The, by content, I mean the text content and the colors and some other features. But uh, can you not use the text uh, instead of the logos for uh, image that doesn't have the logo? the header text like for yes. the, yes. the main upgrading text the, the main header text that are displayed on the ad uh okay we will try to use that approach like we we were just looking for the logo image and try to extract that okay so you're saying that the logo doesn't even appear on the image right on the assets on the assets yes. folder yeah. it doesn't actually appear like we, most of them have a logo png but uh, mm -hmm. again like some of the assets don't really have a uh, logo.png. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, not mail, is that an answer or? Not mail, most for sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I, just want, I just want to comment on the solution you just came okay. up with. Uh, if we extract the uh, main header text, uh, the logo position will be always on the top left corner, right? Mm. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. Hello. Am I not audible? You, you're audible, not me. Okay. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, uh, what I want to say is, uh, if we extract. Uh, main header text the logo position will be always the same so how are we going to deal with that uh okay so are you saying that for all of the images or for all of the extracted images the header logos are on top or on the left or on the left side of the uh, main header
um, yeah, it's going to be on the top uh, position, right? If if you are extracting, if you are just looking for takers, some header takers, the header are usually on the top. So we might not, we might not actually get a logo exactly. Okay, but if if you can't get the image, if if you can't using the object the different object detection methods, you can at least detect the different objects that are on the image. And if you can get the exact location of the header or the main header file in that image, can you not extract the uh, the logo from that specific location? Because you can segment and detect the different objects that are on that image. And if you can specifically extract the header, why can't you not extract the logo if it's, in, if it's always on top of the header? I, I haven't given it uh, more thought, but... Okay, so, or, or at least let me ask you this way. Okay, uh, what are you I don't get your idea, but I'll try that. Okay, what, what, are you, what different approaches are you trying or trying to use to extract the logo currently? Or how are you trying to extract the logo from one image? Uh, I'm trying to train a new model that can detect mm. models. Okay, so yeah, are you I'm, giving... I'm, I'm, I'm building a new model that with the... Okay, how are I you trying have to... delay. Okay, is it from my side? Maybe let me switch my network. I don't think it's from your side. I can hear you quite clearly. Uh, okay, so... Uh, not me. Okay, is it from my switch? I okay, can yes. delay. Uh, I can now hear you clearly. Go on. Okay, so uh, the method I'm following is I'm, I'm setting up a new model that can detect logos, like any logos from an image. I'm, I have a data set of like 4 GB or 3.5 GB data set. So I'm training a model on that and then I'll use that model to detect the logos. But I don't think that's an easier way. I think there is one simple library who, that can detect a logo from any image. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, uh, we, we only want the logo position. I don't know if, if I'm not mistaken, but we only want the logo position for analysis, right? Yes, we don't want any further uh, information from the logo because that's not that might not be relevant because the business is already identified by a specific logo. So we just want the location and how that location will have an impact to the uh, to the users of that web application or uh, to the different to, to different people to uh, any kind of people that are going to use. Uh, the application and we'll be seeing that advertisement. Yeah. So in that case, I think my current model would hopefully would work for that issue. Okay. Yeah. So are you uh, training? Like you. Okay. So are you training your model using uh, multiple images that contains logos? Only logos? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so have you started the training or how is it going? I'm just writing some quotes. Uh, I'll start the training in a few minutes. I'm just okay. 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 Uh, and yesterday, I've been trying to look at the at uh, each group's GPU instance usage, and I don't think any one of you uh, is using the GPU. Most of you are just utilizing the CPU. Uh, just try to use the GPU. You can install the TensorFlow GPU package. TensorFlow uh, above the point of, I think, is, al is already by default installed with uh, GPU access, but you need to uh, configure your CUDA and CDNN access uh, and try to configure that and uh, 
uh, try to utilize the GPU because you have about 24 gigabytes of GPU access on your instance and your models will train much more faster than uh, the CPU instance usage. Uh, okay, Mohammed. Uh, yes, uh, I had some issues with extracting the local position. I, I, I heard you uh, that it's not uh, necessary to extract the logo, but the logo position is necessary. So um, I didn't get uh, what Matt Nile uh, said. Um, can, can you repeat that? Uh, okay, so what we are trying to do is we are trying to extract or we are trying to identify uh, the different positions for the logos that will attract users to click on that specific ad. So the logo might appear on top of the header, on the right, on the left, or on different positions of the image. And uh, users, different users are attracted or uh, different users might click the logo, the ad if it is in different positions. So we are trying to optimize and identify the position that would most suit uh, for users that are going to use that, uh, that, are, that we want uh, to click the ad. So we might target a specific type of user it might be based on their personality or some different criteria. So on those criteria, we want to place the logos for different uh, users according to their personality. So we want to know the position or the location of the logo on that specific image or on that specific ad. Okay, I, I got that, uh, but how? Okay, so one way Nathaniel is uh, proposing is that to train uh, a model to identify the exact location of an image of a, the exact location of one of a logo uh, by training maybe as Nathaniel said by training a model you can at least uh, detect the logo if you just use an object detection model you can detect the different objects that are on your image but you can't exactly uh, uh, know where the logo is in that specific image. So you need to identify the exact location or position of an image uh, to extract it from uh, an image. So I think so, one way might, might be to train a model, but I also think that there are already pre-trained models. I'm not exactly sure uh, about their efficiency. I, I think, yes, there are some good models. I will also try to look into that and uh, maybe share those models, share those implementations as well. But for Nathaniel also, try to start that model training today because today is already Thursday and we need uh, to be sure that the model is working and you can progress to the next tasks. So uh, I have I have one, one follow-up question. So um, I will be giving the model uh, the logos and uh, I will train Train it with the the, the data set, the provided data set. So when when I'm going to detect uh, maybe a new logo, uh, a new logo position. So I will I will be giving him the logo in the first place, and I will ask the model to uh, to locate uh, the position of the logo. No, no, you'll just be giving the image to the model, and the the model should be able to extract or at least identify the exact location or position of the logo in that image. Okay, got that. So I will, I will reach to my file for further. Okay. okay. And, and, and uh, if you found anything up. Uh, sure, you sure. I'll keep you updated. I will uh, update you on the weekly level channel. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, okay, just a minute, guys, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry for that. Uh, so today's session is going to be focused on feature extraction from an image. Uh, so it's from uh, it's from this research paper, uh, which is predicting the personal appeal of marketing images using computational methods. Uh, sorry. Uh, a resource is already shared 
on uh, it's already shared on uh, on the document i will uh, just go over their implementation what they did to uh, uh, to to exactly identify which image to display as an ad for different types of users uh, okay so uh, most commercial ad ads are moving from one to many communication to a personalized one to one communication uh, in early age, we most companies or most advertising industries used to focus to just uh, transmit information from the one side to the uh, to the entire uh, community which are going to use their application or which are going to see their advertisements. Uh, but now, what we want to do in order to utilize the advertisements and gain uh, more click through rates, what companies are doing is that they are targeting specific or uh, so they are targeting uh, categories of audiences based on their personality. So, what um what I might see on a web page might be different for, from what you guys might see on a web page. So, based on my personality, uh, I'm going to see a different advertisement that might uh, grab my attention and uh, turn that into a success rate. So, what they will do or what they are going to do first is going to uh, identify my personality and my personality is very clear uh, when using the web applications and different social media applications everything is being recorded and uh, uh, there are applications that utilize the cookies and other uh, tracking behaviors to track what my personality is and identify uh, my personality into the different category and then from the marketing perspective we can design different advertisements or different ads, different creatives that will target each different types of personalities. So uh, different machine learning algorithms are used to predict each type of features that would attract different personalities. And the personalities of each individual is based on the five factor which model, which is uh, stable across different cultures. Uh, it might be extraversion, agreeableness, open, openness to experience and so on. And these personalities are uh, almost the same from uh, uh, from country to country and from uh, one culture to the another. So if you can study the different personalities that are uh, that are most common or most similar on each category, we, we can then uh, we can then target each category uh, of the personalities and uh, send a different advertisement and uh, target each uh, category accordingly. Uh, so after since we are, since it's already clear and it's known that the different personalities of uh, people we can now move uh, on to study the different personalities of an image because uh, someone who is extrovert will like will probably or most likely like uh, a certain type of image and introverts will like a certain type of image with certain characteristics and uh, based on the other characters like agreeableness, openness, uh, we'll have different type of characteristics. So in agreeableness, there might be the warm versus the critical. Uh, and the from the extraversion, uh, we might have from the outgoing and enthusiastic uh, versus the reserved and the quiet. So each different, each type of the characteristics in each type of the uh, categories or personalities will have different preference over the other. So what we want to do is we want to target each type of uh, uh, each type of personalities that are uh, already known and target them uh, uh, and design an ad or creative that will uh, uh, grab their attention or uh, change the success rate, increase the success rate of an ad. So based on the type of feature that's on an image, we can predict the personality of an image. So moving on from the personality of people, we can now move to a personality of an image. Personality of an image might be anything and a bit confusing, but what it is is that uh, each image will have a different personality. So uh, some type of image might be more likable to uh, a different type or to a specific type of uh, personality of people. And we want to identify and we want to know uh, what are the different characteristics or what are the different types of features in those images that will uh, 
that will be suitable or that will be matching or fit to a specific personality uh, of people. So each category of an image uh, then can be stored. And when we are going to target a specific individual with a specific personality, we can take that from the database uh, after storing the different categories of an image or the different personality of an image. Uh, we can then store that on a database. Then when we want to target a specific uh, part of, an, of our audience, maybe the younger population, the older population, or the middle-aged population, we can then take uh, that specific, uh, those specific categories from our uh, database and serve that, serve that on the web application. So mostly investigated features include color, colorfulness, lighting conditions, complexity and simplicity, level of detail, size, aspect ratio, and so on. So we have lots of features that can be extracted from the from an image. Actually, we can't extract all of the features from the image because uh, we have not only thousands, but millions of features that can be extracted from an image. And we only want to extract the features that will be relevant for our users. Sometimes it's best to uh, to get the general picture and the combination of the different features, but uh, most in most applications, we only use some of the features from an image, which is believed or even scientifically proved to have an impact or uh, will be more relatable to a specific personality of people. Uh, okay, so what are the features in an image? So the main features in an image uh, are, the first one is the color. Color is represented by that equation in color. Uh, yes, it's a question. Uh, I want to just understand. Uh, did you mention the personality? Um, um, with, uh, 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 sorry, it's a personality of people just as, a, as an example because for this, or are we, is this uh, paper like, does it uh, actually target uh, people? Oh, well, uh, does it, uh, oh, sorry. Um, is it a machine learning uh, project to find like uh, pictures that appeal to certain personalities in in the customers? Uh, uh, okay, yeah, I think when we are uh, when we are trying to uh, understand the personality of an image, we have to know the personalities of people, right? So, uh, which type of people would prefer uh, this specific type of an image? So after we understand our users or our customers, we then can design the image, the creatives based on our customers' need or preference. So the personality of an image will, uh, uh, will come from the personality of people. So, so, part of, since, sorry, okay. so part of the data is uh, like the personalities of, of, the, of the users of, or the customers, is it? Uh, yes. but. It, sometimes there is the bias in different factors that would uh, distort the actual uh, personality of the image. So we want to use different scales. Uh, I think on the paper, they use the, the Z standard score uh, measure to calculate the actual value or the actual personality of an image, which is calculated from, uh, which, is, uh, which is taken from multiple users. And then they calculated the Z score uh, for that image and they got some kind of value and stored that value as a specific category of personality of an image. Okay. But okay. since it's already known, since the personality of people is already known, uh, we are not most interested in knowing or understanding or even studying the personality of people. We want to know the personalities of the personality of an image and to which category each image would belong to. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm taking so long uh, to get this. Uh, no, so, no, 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 okay. Yeah, so it, it, I'm just trying to understand is that besides the image, we do we have data that is coming from the users. It's not, it's not. Um, maybe it's a score. It's something, but uh, um, it, it, we have uh, like a in, in addition to the images themselves, we have some scoring that is coming from like a. Uh, from from the responses of the users, um, uh, is that calculate, correct? Yes, to calculate the personality of an image, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, we are first we are first gathering the data from multiple users. Then the machine learning will then map a new image from our already trained images. So we will first collect data from many users, lots of users, and we can have a base model. If that base model is wrong or completely, uh, or if it's something that will uh, distort the actual truth or the ground truth, we, we are in a big trouble. But if you can collect a correct data from uh, people with different personalities and map each image to a specific category, then we can build an, an ML model that will predict uh, a new image and categorize that to a specific uh, personality of an image. But the first data is collected from users. Okay, okay, thank you, I get it. Yeah. Uh, so features, so what are we trying to look into uh, when extracting uh, features from an image? The main features that are uh, that are mostly collected from images are color. The first one is color, which is represented by the HSV model, measuring the hue, the saturation, and the value in color features. And they include the distribution of the color. Uh, it might be average, standard deviation, and variance. Uh, it might be composed in different, uh, each type of the feature in a color, even in each type of feature in a color might be composed in different way. And we want to get the composition of the color. We also uh, are interested, we are also interested in predicting the emotions elicited by the colors in terms of valence, arousal and dominance and color diversity in the proportion of different colors from a set of uh, 11 standard colors. So the standard colors are the red, the yellow, the blue uh, and so on. And the other one is the composition. The composition uh, refers to the spatial organization of visual elements in an image independent of the image subject. So uh, the composition is how each object or each uh, elements or entities are organized in that specific image. And the texture refers to the spatial arrangement of intensity and colors in an image or image region. And finally, the content, uh, what actually is in that image or it refers to the objects that are in the image. Uh, so uh, they represented it uh, in this way. So the level of composition might be high or might be low. And this will be perceived by different users and uh, each user will have a different taste of image. So someone uh, with a specific personality or with a specific uh, trait might uh, prefer one of the uh, the high composition image over the low composition image, uh, or uh, he might prefer the low uh, compo the, the low color uh, image instead of the high uh, color image. And the compo the brightness is also another thing that is in the composition. We c we might have a low brightness or uh, a high brightness, and the number of people is uh, in the content category. So the content might be. Uh, we might identify each content by the number of people or by the type of objects that are in the image uh, or uh, by the interactions of the objects that are in the image. So we have very uh, different types of compositions, colors, uh, level of details and so on. We have different features in our image and we want to build a model that will uh, accurately predict uh, each type of image and categorize that to a specific personality. Uh, so in on the content of the of an image, the features extracted can be split into five categories. Uh, and that might be the color, the composition, the content, the texture, the age. Uh, and we are uh, uh, we are interested in extracting those features and uh, setting up each uh, setting up each values of those features to a specific category and our machine learning model or our deep learning model uh, will then be able to build on top of that and categorize each image. Uh, so one of the things that we can look into is the age detection. Uh, mostly, it's mostly used to identify and extract objects from an image. So uh, most object detection algorithms that are currently available use the age detection. So if we know the age of an object, we can easily identify or we can easily uh, distinguish different objects that are in the image. And shapes are the one of the important features that we can use to identify different objects. And 
each shape is bounded by an edge and identifying that edge would enable us to detect the objects in an image. And an edge is basically where there is a sharp change in color. So when there is a sharp change in color uh, across the edge, between, uh, across the edge, we can say that that's an edge of an object. And that's how uh, most object detection algorithms work. They just try to uh, look at differences between colors, uh, between saturations across uh, uh, across the image and when there is a sharp difference or when there is uh, a high difference between color uh, between two different parts of the image we can be sure that there is an edge in between uh, those two different colors uh, okay so this is one example that you can find mostly on the internet so for example there is a dog here and uh, in order to identify the age of the dog uh, we can uh, target different parts of the dog. So as you can see here, uh, there is a sharp difference of color uh, between uh, the ear of the dog and the outer part, which is the background uh, of the image. And when there is a difference in color, in the saturation, the brightness, and different different features that's available uh, on the image, uh, we can say that that's the, the line in between is the edge uh, of uh, of that specific object. So this is the matrix representation of uh, uh, the object or the look, and this is the specific part. Uh, this is the specific representation. So we can see that may maybe eight five might be this specific part of the look, and the outer feature or the background might be seventy eight. And this is the pixel values of the image. And uh, every time we load an image or when working on uh, with a, on an image, uh, images are represented in numbers and there are pixel values that them mostly it's from zero to, to, to 55 and uh, each will have a value based on their color. So it's uh, when we are reading uh, an RGB image using the RGB image, uh, we have the red, the green and the blue and uh, each part of the image or each Yes, each part of the image will be represented by a pixel, and the pixel value will denote the uh, the red, the green, or the blue uh, property of the color. So here we can see that the first, the, the outer part or the background is 78, then we have 85, then there is 89. So what edge detection algorithms will do is that they will subtract the difference between 89 and 78, and the larger the difference between uh, those two endpoints, we can conclude that the middle part or the line in between is an edge of the object. So uh, one way to do that or one way to implement that is to manually go over each pixel when we are especially on object detection and segmentation. The algorithms are implemented that in a way that they just don't look on the entire image, but rather uh, they will go from uh, from one point of the image to the other point of the image by going through some amount of pixels. Then when moving from one pixel to another, not only one pixel, but a set of pixel, when moving from a set of pixel to the other set of pixel, they will try to calculate the difference uh, between each uh, between between each in the points and the, if there is uh, a larger difference between the in the points, uh, they say that there is an edge on that specific uh, end of the image. Uh, but this is a very difficult, not difficult, but more resource intensive. There is a better implementation, which, which is the pre-wit kernel edge detection. This is not the only uh, kernel edge detection algorithm that's available. We also have another, others, other algorithms that are uh, available to detect edges that are more uh, better and efficient in terms of usage. And this kernel can be used to highlight the edges in an image the same way that we uh, did by subtracting the endpoints of an image, the endpoints of uh, a set of pixels. Uh, and when using this specific kernel edge detection, we take the value surrounding the selected pixel and multiply it with the selected kernel, which is in our case, the pre-width kernel. And we can then add the resulting values to get a final value. So uh, we'll first assign a kernel that we are going to use. So in pre-width, there is the horizontal and the vertical uh, kernel that can be used. So if you are interested in calculating or in uh, determining the age of an object horizontally, uh, we'll be using the horizontal kernel. So a specific values will be assigned and these values will be multiplied to each 
endpoints of the set of pixel that we are calculating when moving uh, from one set of pixel to the other set of pixel. And then uh, some will be, uh, the, we can calculate the final value by just adding them up. And if the difference, based on the difference of the values that are calculated, uh, we can conclude, uh, we can uh, predict if there is an edge on those set of pixels or uh, if, if it is the same object that we are looking into. So by using this edge kernel detection algorithm or different algorithms, we can uh, first extract edges uh, uh, from an image and we can identify the different objects that are available on, on the object. Uh, okay, so I think uh, we can now uh, dive into the into some implementations. Let me stop sharing and let me share under it. Sorry, uh, you were breaking up from my side. I think it's from my side. Uh, can you go over the Puita uh, algorithm? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the previous kernel age detection. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I okay. can. Uh, okay. So when using this uh, kernel edge detection algorithm, what it will do is that it will assign uh, a specific kernel. So we, we might have a, an, a horizontal kernel or a vertical kernel. Based on, the, uh, based on the object detection algorithm that we want to use, we might use the horizontal one or the vertical one. And uh, what previous kernel edge detection uh, algorithm will do is it will first assign uh, a set of uh, a set of pixels that are minus one zero with a with a difference with a different values of minus one zero and one combination and we'll have a different value based on the type of kernel that you are going to use if if you are going to use the vertical kernel we'll have a different set of values if you are going to use the horizontal kernel we'll have a different set of values then each value will be mapped to each uh, edge of that specific set of pixels. So each will be mapped when we are moving from one set of the image to the other, to the next set of the image. Each uh, point of the image will be assigned to each, uh, each set of the kernels edge will be assigned to each set of pixels of the image and they will be multiplied together. And when they are multiplied, we will get a specific value. And finally, to calculate or uh, to get the result, we will sum up each of the ages different each of the ages and uh, based on our result that we get after multiplying that with the uh, previous kernel uh, we can uh, identify if there is an edge on that specific int or uh, if there is no edge or if it's a specific object that uh, if if it's an object with uh, no edges so we can conclude that it's an object and we haven't moved to another object or we haven't yet identified another object on that, on, on that image. And if there is an image, uh, we can say that this is the int, the one part of, the, this is the one part end of that image and we'll be moving to the other set of uh, objects in that image. When going up, left, right or down, uh, based on our direction, we can specify different measures and uh, we can know the different uh, the each endpoints of the edges of that object. So maybe we will look into the uh, code implementation of not through it, but the general edge detection. What it will do is it will map each of the values or each of the pixel, each of the set of the pixels of an image when moving from one part of the image to the another part of the image. And each part will be mapped to the previous kernel algorithm. And after the calculation is done, uh, the algorithm will be uh, will be highlighting or uh, mapping the edges of the objects. So it won't know the general or the bigger picture of the image, but it will at least know each edges of the object. So when you, if you get maybe 10 objects on a specific image, uh, each object's edge will be highlighted and we can then uh, construct an additional model that will detect what each object is uh, on that specific image. Is it clear or? Thank you. Yeah, 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 it's clear now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me share my. Uh...
my waistcoat and Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, to extract, we can extract uh, different features from one image. Uh, in this session, we are just going to look into uh, edge extraction, color extraction, uh, and some content extraction. Uh, I have some images that I've downloaded. Uh, the first one, yes, for the image, for the edge extraction, we are going to use this. Uh, image. Uh, so uh, we we have lots of libraries that are available out there with different uh, with their own uh, benefits and drawbacks. Uh, we'll just we'll be in this session. We'll use the Prewit and the OpenCV's edge detection algorithm to just uh, detect the edges uh, of each object that's on an image. So when using uh, the previous algorithm we can just import that from sk image and then from sk image dot filters we can import the previous h and the previous uh, v then uh, we'll use matplotlib to plot the image that we have but when using uh, opencv we can use opencv to plot the image as well so first we'll just read the image and we are reading uh, we are first reading it as grayscale so it will just read that uh, as a grayscale uh, when uh, reading the image, then uh, we are giving the previous edge of the image and the previous uh, v uh, the vertical one of the image, and then to just calculate the vertical one, uh, we'll just display once we give the image to the previous vertical or the pre to the previous uh, horizontal, we can display the image and see how uh, previous calculated the edge and. Uh, highlighted the edges of uh, the image of the objects that are on the image. So here, maybe to just yes. So okay, maybe let me open the image on this side. Uh, so this was the image, and uh, Prewit or any other computer vision algorithms doesn't know about the image. They just look at uh, pixels of the image, and they will what they will do or what the algorithm's implementation looks like is it will move from one segment or from one end of the image to the other end of the image and when it moves or when it shifts on a window level from one set of from one place of the image to the other uh, it will be identifying if there is a difference uh, of color between the one edge of the image and the other end of the image and Based on that calculation, based uh, here specifically, based on the previous uh, algorithm implementation, it's highlighting the age of the person uh, that's the object that's available on the image. And we also have something, yes, there is some kind of tool. And we can also see that uh, the algorithm uh, also highlighted that specific uh, object. So here we can at least see that from a high level uh, overview, we can see that. Uh, there is a person on the image, there is some kind of tool on the image, and there is also a background. So uh, just the high level overview of object detection and uh, for further object segmentation, the first part will mostly be uh, uh, age detection, then further algorithms can be applied on it, on top of it, and uh, we can then detect what each object is, uh, and we can also uh, perform the localization, then uh, we can also use the segmentation. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yes, this is the horizontal one. The first one was when we were using the vertical, and this is the horizontal. It's a bit different. The algorithms or the kernels uh, calculation or the kernels number differs uh, from the horizontal. Uh, the, the, the horizontal kernel numbers or pixels differ uh, from the vertical one, so we'll get a slightly different type of uh, image from the vertical image when using the previous vertical and when using the previous horizontal one. But uh, I think both of them got the image correctly and the edges are uh, identified correctly as well. Can, okay. can we combine them together? Uh, why would you want to combine them together? There are the different approach that we can use to uh, 
uh, highlight or identify ages. Okay, because I see uh, in the first image, uh, it's better detected uh, some of uh, the the horizontal uh, edges, and in the vertical edges, it as you can see, it it, yeah. uh, it, it detected uh, it very clearly. So can, yes. can I combine them together to have a better result? Okay, um, uh, I'm not exactly sure if you can combine them, but uh, I think mostly the horizontal. Uh, algorithm or implementation is used when using the pre algorithm, but uh, I think the OpenCV and the other algorithms uh, are also available, but uh, this is one of the implementation. I'm not exactly sure if you can combine the, the two results and uh, take the, the base side of each uh, result from the vertical and from the horizontal. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, then uh, to get the distribution of the colors. So when extracting the colors, we can get the distribution of the color, the intensity, the saturation, the brightness in different features. Uh, we can map that to a histogram. So on, our, on a histogram, we can uh, plot the image. So we'll be using from the same library, we'll be using the histogram, uh, we'll be importing histogram and read our image uh, as a gray scale image. Then, uh, by just using the histogram, we can then plot the image. So from this, this is the grayscale of the image. We can see that the intensity and the values of the histogram are uh, will be at a specific set uh, uh, of the scale of the histogram. So when getting or when working with different type of image, each image will have a different value or different scale uh, uh, a scale on the histogram. So this is one measure that we can use when extracting the feature from an image and mapping that uh, to a specific personality of an image. So when we have a different personality of a person, and let's say uh, one of the personality might be the openness, uh, someone is open that has open personality uh, will prefer a specific values, that will prefer a specific uh, image with a specific values uh, on the on the histogram. So what we will be trying to do when combining those different features, uh, the features from the color, from the intensity, from the content, from the position of the logos, or from the arrangement uh, of the contents of the image that are on the image, we are trying to map the personalities uh, of people to a specific personality of an image. So once we find out the different personalities that are available on an image, we can then assign or uh, display different arts for each uh, different types of personalities that we are going to target. Uh, so when we want to use the OpenCV, I think the most popular algorithm uh, for when working with image is the OpenCV. We can install that using pip and uh, okay. that equation and Yes, uh, can you explain like what the uh, histogram actually uh, tells us? Uh, okay, so the histogram is just mapping the set. Uh, it will first extract by when we, when we are first reading the image, it will extract uh, the composition of the image or the pixel values of the image. It's, we are just reading it as the gray value, as, the, as a gray image and it will uh, take the pixel values and it will map it to a it, it will map it to a histogram. So on the histogram, what's being displayed is the pixel values or the pixel arrangements of the image. So different images will have different pixel values, and those pixels will refer to the composition of the image, to the saturation of the image, to the brightness of the image. And each color will have a different value and different level of pixel. So the histogram will map that specific image uh, values. And when we bring another image, if the images are almost similar or almost in, in terms of brightness, saturation, or the different characteristics that are available on the image, they will be mapped to a different set of uh, values on the histogram. So we can then categorize uh, the different images based on their values or representations on the histogram. And the histogram is just represented by the pixel values that are on the image. So from the range of zero to 255, they are, they are aligned on a different set and they might be more bright at some specific set of the image. For example, let's say 
uh, uh, okay, let's just say 20, 34, 45, 23, 12. Uh, maybe let's make it zero, then zero, 12, six. Uh, let's just say that we have an image uh, with this uh, specific pixel values. Uh, then maybe this specific area of the image on uh, the array level one, two, which is 12, 36, 25, and on the second position of the array, horizontally, the 23, 45, and 12 uh, have more higher pixel values from the others, starting from the zeros index. So each image will have a different arrangement of pixels uh, when they are being read by uh, uh, when by, by when they are being read using image by IM read or OpenCV and we, they are represented by their pixel values and this histogram will map each of the representation to uh, to a, to a histogram so if you have a similar image in terms of uh, maybe saturation or intensity or brightness or the different criteria or the different features that are available on color or on an image, the more similar image or image with similar categories will be mapped to a histogram that will have almost the same value uh, on the histogram. So the lower the value, the, the lower the value, if an image, if one image has about zero, or if the value of one of the image is on this, uh, end of the index or the axis, and the other one is on this end of the axis with different values, with different with the different pixel values. The the pixel values are uh, uh, cross calculated to each other, and that's what the value is uh, uh, telling on the y axis. And if they are completely different, or if they are on a different category, they will have they will be represented by the different on the different axis of. The, on the different value of the x-axis and their y-value will also indicate uh, their intensity or brightness or the different features that are available on the, on the image. Uh, okay, so then we, we can also use the OpenCV. So we can read the image using the OpenCV and we can again uh, look at the age of the image by using the different libraries on the OpenCV. I think on OpenCV, Kani is one of the most popular library that's available. So by using the Kani, uh, we can extract the age of an image. This will also extract the age from the image. There are multiple approaches that we can use uh, to extract age, and one of them is OpenCV. The other one is uh, by just using the pre-width or even other similar libraries that use similar algorithms to pre-width. Uh, okay, uh, so extracting colors from an image, I think we have already gone through this on Mendes or to the, uh, Tuesday's tutorial. Uh, so when extracting colors from an image, uh, we'll use the AXT colors library that is uh, a Python pip, uh, a PyPy library that, that can be found on PyPy. Uh, so we first install uh, these libraries to use uh, AXT colors uh, and then I will be uh, I'll be using this image to extract the colors that are uh, on this image. So we are first reading that image and uh, we are assigning we are scaling that image to a specific pixel. So most of the time we might have uh, an image with different sizes. so uh, we mostly want to uh, limit or we want to give a static, uh, value of for the width and the height. Uh, I think mostly when you're working with OpenCV, it's 124 by 124. Uh, so the lower the scale of the image, the better to get the features. So it will be easy and fast to uh, to extract the features that are available on the image. Uh, but if you have a very good resource or uh, compute resource available, we can also work with larger images. So uh, we are first scaling it to uh, the width is 900 to uh, uh, to rescale that image to a specific ratio. Then after rescaling that, we are saving that image and uh, this is the rescaled image. Uh, then we have already installed XT colors. So 
XT colors can be found, can be, you can uh, go to this. Mm. That's the PyPy uh, link for XC colors. So uh, the, uh, there are two options, not only two, but we have other optional arguments as well, but we are mostly interested in the tolerance and the limit. So the tolerance will group the colors to limit the output and give a better visual representation. So the range for uh, the tolerance is from zero to 100 and uh, zero means grouping it uh, uh, first hundred will group all of the image to is to one color, while uh, zero uh, will group or will try to identify all of the available uh, all of the available colors that are on the image. And then the limit is uh, to limit the output or the number to limit the number of extracted feature, features from the image. And we can use the tolerance and the color uh, as a parameter as an optional parameter. And uh, mostly on the internet, most people suggest to use twill for the tolerance and the limit you can uh, increase that or decrease that based on the result that you get uh, after extracting uh, the image or after extracting the color. So sometimes uh, you just might get uh, a limited number of colors when trying to extract with uh, with 12 as the tolerance and maybe 12, 13 or 14 as the limit. So what you want to do is to increase the tolerance and the limit of uh, uh, the, the tolerance and the limit parameters of the uh, method, and we can get more uh, more colors from that image. So when we just extract the colors by using 12 as the tolerance and 12 as the limit, we'll get uh, the colors that are extracted from the image. So this is the first set of image, which is uh, which is yes, which is almost white, and the number of occurrences of uh, this white image. So uh, this is the image, so uh, it's extracting white. It's saying that white color, uh, white colors occurrence is about is mostly the, the image is mostly white or almost white, and then the next one is this color with the uh, frequency or fre with the frequency of occurrence, and the list goes on. So what it will do is it will extract each color and it will assign or it will also calculate the frequency or the number of occurrence uh, of each color. Uh, then, uh, if this is also a command line argument, we can use the XT colors and then uh, give the image directly from our directory paths, and then we can get the percentage of uh, the percentage of occurrences of each uh, colors that are extracted. So uh, the white color or the almost white color will is has forty percent. Uh, of occurrence, the next one has 31% and the list goes on. So if you want to get more colors or more uh, different type of color, be, uh, if you want to uh, if you want to extract more uh, different type of colors from the image, we can increase the tolerance. Also, we can also increase the limit that is being returned from the image. Uh, okay, so what we can do is to then visualize the uh, is that the question? Yes. Okay. So when it uh, like when it extract the colors, uh, it's uh, it is like uh, it is returning this tuple, right? So in the other in the it is the RGB and their yes. occurrences. So is it calculating like the exact uh, value uh, or is it like rounding or like uh, is it uh, like counting? colors close to this specific value it is showing us uh, in the yes. left hand. Yes, yes, it's it's not, it doesn't mean that uh, this is uh, an image that is nearly or almost white, right? Uh, but we can see that, uh, we can't exactly say that all of the regions in the image or most of the regions in the image are right. But when you are grouping it into 12 categories or into 12 groups, it will group all of the images that are almost similar or uh, uh, or identical to the white color or this specific color given. It will count them uh, as this color or as this category. Okay. It will do the same Not for exactly. all of the... That's very like close to them. Yes. Okay. So uh, if you increase the tolerance or uh, the the limit that's being returned, the, the, the list will grow and we'll have 
uh, this specific occurrence or frequency will decrease for each group because now we'll have more colors or more categories of colors being returned. Oh, I get that. I get it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Can can we specify the colors that you want to the algorithm to detect? Uh, I think the point of using the algorithm is to identify the colors. If you already want uh, a specific color or if you have a specific color in mind, why would you want to use that? We just want to extract the colors from the image, right? Okay. So uh, we want to know the percentage of the white color appearance in that image, the gray color or the black color appearance on that image and so on. So that okay. will give us a list uh, of the colors that are appearing on that image in the number of occurrence. Okay, because uh, I asked that question because uh, in the paper of predicting the personal appeal, um, uh, they, they specify that we, we are uh, extracting the picture for uh, 11 uh, colors. Mm. So with that reason, I thought that uh, those uh, colors that already uh, predefined uh, is is uh, important for the feature extraction or the yes yes I think if I get your point correctly you are right but that's what the machine learning algorithm should be able to do uh, once we have the data set that's accurate and collected from uh, ma many or, or lots of users the machine learning should be able to categorize the the color categories or the extracted color categories and map it to a specific personal individual personality in the, uh, of a person. So okay. if you have the, pers the occurrence of the image in this, uh, maybe let's, let me use this one. Yes, uh, let's say this is a white or let's say it's uh, an almost, yes, it's a white color and uh, a personality with openness. This is just an example, I'm not generalizing. So if someone is open, he might prefer an image with uh, uh, that that is mostly white or almost white and uh, the second one might be uh, the brown image yes this brown or yes the brown image and so on so we can't do all of the mapping that's on the image and map it to a specific personality of an individual the the model should be able to take all of the features that are relevant to the model or to the target variable and map it or assign that to a specific uh, personality. Okay, I get that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, then uh, this is just an additional uh, the thing that we can do uh, to represent that, uh, to, to represent the image that we found or the category or the composition of the colors that we have, uh, that we got from uh, XT colors library. We can convert that to the hex and since this might not be uh, readable by humans. I don't think hex is also readable, quite readable, but uh, we can convert that to the uh, hex value and we can use uh, the RGB to hex library that's also available in Python. And uh, after getting this list, this is the list that is returned uh, when uh, extracting different colors from an image. We can split that, we can uh, split and replace some of the values and we can map each of uh, each of the pixel values uh, to, an, uh, to a hex value. So this is what this line of code is doing. Uh, you can also find this from the uh, from their official documentation, especially from the XT colors. On the XT colors, all of this implementation is available. Then uh, we can see here uh, that the white color or, or the almost white color, yes, only the second one is E. Uh, all f or three f or six f uh, is white. So this color, this color's occurrence is about four hundred fifty nine, or four million five hundred ninety six thousand, and so on. So for each of the uh, extracted color, we or it we can also get the number of occurrence of that specific color on that specific image. And then finally, we can use the donuts chart to visualize that and. Uh, have a better understanding of the composition of the image. So, uh, when using the donut color, uh, when using the donut chart to visualize, uh, we can uh, finally use the matplots subplots to uh, to plot the uh, multiple images on 
uh, on, a, on a single chart, and then we can get the distribution of the colors or the composition of the colors that are on the image. So we can see that the white color uh, is, uh, this is the white color, and then the second one is the brown color, which is 15%, and then the 9% is this specific color and so on. So by increasing uh, the parameters that are available on the XT colors library, we can extract more colors from uh, our image, but uh, 12 is mostly recommended one to extract colors and map that to a personality of uh, a person. Uh, okay, then we can also use that to uh, uh, to visualize the hex mapping. So the first one is the uh, the one for the almost white color and the list goes on. Okay, uh, the the next topic is text extraction. Uh, okay, so in text extraction is also implemented using Tesseract. Tesseract is the popular library for extracting the open source and popular library for extracting text from one image. And in Python, Python, uh, we have the PyTesseract, PyTesseract, which is built on top of the Tesseract. Tesseract is built by, it's, op, it's developed and maintained by Google, and PyTesseract is built on top of Tesseract and uh, provides a library for uh, Python side implementation. You can download uh, the PyTesseract package from PyPy by going uh, uh, to this link, I will provide the notebook. And then if you are on Linux or Mac or Windows, you'll have a separate or different uh, installation process for each operating system. And you will have to import the executable file uh, from your uh, local development machine. So for, for Linux, I'm on Linux, you'll have to install the uh, libtesseract minus div module, and then uh, you'll need to import that tesseract's uh, Installed location to your script in, to, to be able to use the PyTesseract. So, since PyTesseract is working or built on top of Tesseract, it won't be able to work or extract in, or extract content uh, of text from an image. We will need to use uh, Tesseract or we will need to install Tesseract and provide uh, that the Tesseract library uh, executable file pass uh, when using on our script. I will also install PyTesseract then. Mm, yes, from PyTruct, I'm importing PyTruct, and then, uh, okay, yes, uh, there might be some dependency issue, I faced some dependency issue, so you might also need to install Tesseract OCR, yes, I think this is required, this isn't a dependency, this is uh, a required package to be able to use, the, to, to use the Tesseract, I installed the Tesseract OCR, and then I finally uh, provided the pass, the executable pass uh, on my machine. It's located under user slash pin and tesseract. So since tesseract is also a command line argument, you can use that uh, on your terminal or uh, on the notebook. You can use the uh, the bank sign and then uh, the pass to your uh, image. And then uh, finally output output that to uh, using to the std out. If you want to output that to a file uh, or uh, or to some other specific location, you can specify that. Since I just want to output uh, the the results to uh, the result in my own uh, console, I will use the SD out. Then I can see that the extracted text from the image is sample text two, and the image is text.png. Yes, this is uh, this is an easy one. Uh, we have. Uh, a background that is easy to uh, clearly uh, detect the text from the background and identify that. But in most cases, you might not, uh, you might be working with transparent background, so uh, you might need to add some kind of uh, background to your uh, text before uh, actually using the text extraction algorithm. So when using the Python site, as I've said earlier, you'll first need to import the library and then uh, to uh, to be able to uh, to extract an uh, a text from to to be able to extract the content or the text from an image, you will use the pytextract dot image to string method that's available on the pytextract uh, algorithm, and then provide the path of the image. Mm, pytextract not defined.
Yes, and then we have the sample takers and we the learning characters. We can also implement the post-processing to uh, extract the text and uh, remove any other unnecessary characters. So the other thing that we can use is we can pre-process our image as well as post-process our image. So uh, sometimes the text might not be in a, in, a, in a position that is relevant for our algorithm. So some of them might be removed, might be reverted. Some of them uh, might have characters that 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 isn't exactly uh, in a way that the PyTorch library can uh, work on. So uh, we can implement some uh, pre-processing on our text. So we can first uh, convert that to grayscale. We can remove noise. These all libraries are available on the CV2 or on OpenCV. We can use the different available uh, the different libraries available on CV2 or OpenCV and then uh, implement the pre-processing. Uh, Sorry, what exactly was thresholding? Sorry for asking this question. Okay, so are you asking the thresholding on the pre-processing or? Uh, are there different types of thresholdings? Okay, yeah, I think on the on other algorithm implementation as well, we have a different, uh, okay, let me just answer the threshold from the image processing that's uh, available on the OpenCV. So uh, the threshold is, uh, the amount or the maximum amount of pixels that are allowed or the, maybe let me show you. Yes, so this is an image. This image is uh, the if underscore text. Okay, so uh, it has a content with a text. This is a lot of 12 point text to test of to take the OCR code and see if it works on all types of file format. So uh, when you have a different image, we can specify the threshold or by threshold, we are saying that uh, the arrangement of each pixel uh, of the text. So open see what, what PyTeract or Tesseract implementation is doing is it will try to extract the text from the image. So the image is already represented by pixel. So from each pixel, some of the arrangement of the text on the pixel on, on the image might be uh, a bit maybe tangled or on a different position. So the colors, the position, the arrangement of the text might be different from one image uh, to the other. So we'll set a specific threshold that is from zero to 255 when reading uh, that specific image. So if it is out of that threshold's bound, uh, we will ignore that or we will escape that. So we are just setting some kind of limits or some amount of uh, expected uh, pixel range uh, when reading that image. Not exactly pixel, but it has its own implementation and it will uh, try to uh, get that specific difference or that specific uh, value, or it will expect that specific value when reading that image. And if it is out of that range, or if it is out of that bound, it will ignore that or it will escape that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. That was my question. Okay. Uh, and we can also use uh, other, we might not use all of the uh, available uh, pre-processing techniques, but we'll experiment on each of the pre-processing technique and uh, only choose the one that suits our need. So we can also uh, disk queue, which will just uh, correct the skewness of the image. And then uh, we'll first uh, try to, uh, we'll use all of the methods, the gate grayscale, the thresholding, the opening and the canny, and we'll have different representations of the image and we'll see the different presentation. So for the grayscale, it's just reading it in the grayscale format. And you can see that uh, this was the original image. Uh, okay. So, 
So this was the original image and we're reading it in grayscale. This is what we get. And then we'll perform the same, the same text extraction. And uh, we can see that the text is uh, accurately extracted. And uh, there is a new line characters at the bottom. We can perform some post-processing. Uh, we can also use the Tesseract library without using the Python wrapper. And we also get a similar result. This will format it in exactly the same way because uh, we are displaying it on our on our own console and uh, backslash n will be forwarded to will be uh, will be uh, directed to a new line. So we'll have a new line on the end of the format, which is similar that we are seeing on the original image, and uh, we'll get the image on the same format that is displayed on the source. Uh, and we can also use the trash. The trash is the threshold. So with some given threshold, uh, it has altered the image. And you can see that the grayscale image is different from the threshold image. This might be relevant for some specific types of image. So based on the image source that you are working on, uh, we might use different pre-processing techniques. And each will result uh, into, a different, uh, uh, into a different output. And the accuracy might be higher or lower. So based on the image that you are working on, we might use a uh, different pre-processing technique. And based on the posi based on the position of the of the image and the quality of the image. Uh, and we can also see that this is also uh, this has also extracted the text correctly from the source file. Uh, and when using the opening, uh, we can see that it has uh, distorted the image. So we just don't use all of the available pre-processing techniques for our image, but we'll be selecting the images that are relevant for them. We'll be using the techniques or the methods that are available and relevant uh, for the image that you are using. And based on the font that is uh, on the image and the arrangements or that of the text on the image, we'll be using different pre-processing techniques. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, it has it, this the accuracy. Uh, of the extracted text is uh, very low or almost, we can say almost zero. Uh, when calculating the word error rate, this will be uh, almost zero. So uh, this is not a good pre-processing technique to use. Uh, this is the CANI, which is the edge, uh, which, which is the edge uh, detection that we used uh, above. So what the edge detection algorithm will do is it will detect the edge of each text because each text has an age, it will be detecting the age of each text, but uh, we can see that it's not performing well. Uh, and the text can be readable by human, but uh, when it comes to computers or the Tesseract implementation, it's not getting it right. As you can see, it's trying to get the text correctly, but uh, it's completely wrong. Uh, okay, so the last thing that uh, I can show you is we can map the position of images, and uh, we can also uh, we can also target a specific part of the image, and uh, we can use that using some regular expressions. So the CV2 uh, library we can first read that using the CV2 or the OpenCV library, and then uh, by using the image underscore two data, and then uh, printing out the keys of the position of each object on our image, we can see that we have, uh, we can get the different uh, positions or the different keys that are available for us to use. So we can get the top one, the width, the height, and the lift, and all of the different keys that are available. So by mapping uh, through our objects that are, that are already identified or that are already detected, we can then, uh, we can then, uh, we can then uh, highlight or draw a rectangle on each uh, text that are on the image. So on CV2, there is the rectangle. We also have some other shapes. So by using those shapes, we can uh, highlight or uh, draw a bounding box on our image. So when using CV2.imshow after drawing a rectangle or bounding box, uh, OK, 
Okay, this is taking a while, uh, but we will see that uh, uh, we will see that uh, each text on the image uh, being uh, bounded or uh, drawn a rectangle line on top of uh, the text that are on the image. It shouldn't take this long. Maybe let me interrupt the kernel and. Ah, okay, I didn't see that. So uh, this was, maybe let me show you the original image. This is the original image, and uh, we can see that we have uh, different texts on the image with some bonding boxes on each image. And then uh, here, what the uh, algorithm did was it, by using the rectangle method available on OpenCV, we, uh, we draw we drew a bonding box on each of the text and on each of the uh, different type of uh, objects that are available or that are present on our image and we can get each of the location it's not getting some of them correctly but it we can see that it has got most almost all of the objects that are uh, on our image uh, I think it's still running. Okay, uh, and then to uh, to get a specific uh, text or to extract a specific image from a specific text from an image, let's say we are looking for the date part from the image, we can use the regular expression, and this is a regular expression which will match the first uh, the date, the month, and the year. So by using a regular expression, we can uh, we can extract or we can highlight the specific part of the image instead of highlighting uh, all of the objects that are available on our image. So uh, you can, uh, okay, you can see my screen, maybe let me share my entire screen. And what? Uh can this library, the, the PyTest Act, uh, uh, understand the human uh, writing, handwriting? And yes. If we yes. have a, yeah, okay, mixed uh, a computer in the human handwriting, can it like uh, identify? Uh, yes, the... it, it, it can identify okay. uh, human writing as well. It, it might not work or it might not be as accurate as uh, the computer writing, but it can identify. It can also identify uh, multiple languages, not only English, but uh, mm -hmm. I think more than 60 languages, and we can work uh, on different languages as well. This was... Yeah. It's okay. like the Amazon test, test rack. There is a test rack service, like it, it uh, like it, that can do this kind of thing. So this library is capable of doing that as well, right? Uh, Yes, it should. I'm not familiar with the Amazon Tesseract implementation, uh, yeah. but okay. I think both of them can extract text, not only from uh, from a computer written uh, text, but also from handwritten uh, text. That's great, thank you. Yeah. So this is uh, the invoice only uh, included the invoice in the text and what we did was we looped through each of the objects and drew a bonding box for each of the objects. And it's not getting some of the parts correctly, but uh, we can see that it has got almost all of the objects correctly and we drew a bonding box on top of it. Uh, okay, so the next thing that we can do is we can search uh, by using a regular expression. And this regular expression is expecting uh, uh, a date, a month, and a year. So the second number on the date might be uh, will be optional because uh, on the first day we might not have uh, the first digit or the second digit. Some uh, some might uh, rep represent the date in as zero one, and some might only represent the date as one. So we are just uh, putting the second. Uh, we are just using the second character as we are just making the second character 
or the second digit optional and we are doing the same for the months and for the date and if we run Yeah, I was running this on on the instance and it was fast uh, since I'm running it on my local machine. Uh, both for sales. Okay, so as you can see, it has got the text or uh, it has merged the text part that you are trying to uh, identify by using the regular expression. You can also try to find the text with a specific patterns. This is easy. It's much more easier when working with text uh, 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 instead of working with image. So uh, to the back to the question that we've, that has been raised on the beginning of the session, uh, we can't match or we can't try to extract images by using these techniques. We might use different libraries or pre-trained modules when uh, we want to extract logos or different image objects, different image objects that are available uh, on the image. But to extract the content, which is a text, it's much easier and we can easily uh, loop through the objects that are available on the image and uh, identify the specific image. And yes, I think uh, this is it. Okay, any questions? Is that a Sorry, I, I accidentally opened my mic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Great then. I think in the afternoon there is the creative uh, Michael. Michael. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mike. Yeah, I was muted. Sorry. Uh, okay. My question uh, is not uh, related to the tutorial, but uh, uh, I want to ask that: Have anyone uh, tried to solve the problem with Pi Auto GUI? Okay, so maybe can you also state the problem or? Is it clear to yeah. you? Maybe for some. I okay. think a lot of us have, uh, yeah, a lot of us have been uh, facing this error, and uh, we are trying to solve it. And I think it it worked for Yisak. Uh, I don't know how it was configured. He also tried to share his approach, but uh, it's still pretty much as as far as I know, it's not working for anybody uh, other than himself. Uh, okay, uh, Fasa, did that work for you? Or? No, actually it didn't. And I think to brief the problem, it, it has got something to do with the environmental variable named display. I don't actually know what really that environment variable do, or I, I just, uh, I just focused on other parts of the task, but I was hoping if somebody else from the group was also able to solve the problem in order to, you know, if if that worked for somebody else, maybe that somebody can do that. And I was thinking about that, but I don't think anybody is able to solve that problem. Thanks. Okay, so it's not working. Yeah, for... uh, to okay. elaborate more about it, the Pi Auto GUI library is used for automating i think mouse actions and some screen actions uh, on a device since we will be we are having a web scraping uh, task so to automate some mouse actions that library mm. is required as far as uh, i dig and uh, i don't know if that is the case because we are using a remote machine since we do not have uh, a uh, display that's related to it, or I've also uh, tried. To, okay, uh, okay. I think we we'll look into it. Maybe Fasa or Michael, can you write down on the Slack channel so we can 
uh, reproduce it been, the exact. Yes. It, it has been written on week 11? Yeah. Okay, so the exact save that you followed is also uh, written on the question. To be honest, I don't think that is uh, necessary because the first time I ran the cell, that error occurred. And oh, I thought okay. it was about oh. some dependencies and I also installed some of the necessary uh, libraries that are required to run PyGUI, I think. Mm. And that didn't even work. So yeah, maybe, yeah. And okay, the last so the, the problem is when you are trying to import the library, Without even trying to use that. Yeah, actually, yes. When I run yeah. the first cell, there is this library, there is this import statement on PyGUI, but the problem is not on PyGUI, I suppose. It is on another library that PyGUI also imports, right? It's called the mouse uh, info, I yeah. think. So yeah, there's this yeah. variable mouse info in mouse info, the display uh, variable that that's something from the Sorry. Okay. Uh, I think we should the fixes that. available. Uh, the fixes available. Uh, try to dictate that uh, declaring it as an environment, in this case, uh, declaring uh, the display variable and setting it a value on the environment can solve it. But it isn't uh, still working for me. Okay. Uh, I think, yes, uh, we're looking to that. Uh, okay, Amanuel, so is it working for you? No, I'm having a problem with it. Oh, The same okay. problem uh, is to that. Okay. Okay, I think we can also do that now. Uh, maybe uh, are we set with the session in this? Yes, okay, uh, we can also do that. Can someone then share his or her screen and Okay, maybe Amanu, you should share your screen and uh, we should all try to debug that together, but uh, I might have to jump into something else. Uh, the tutorial team will look into that separately. Uh, let us know if there is any, any update from you guys. Maybe Amanu will give us an update on the Slack channel and we'll look into that uh, maybe together in the afternoon. Okay. Okay, I think we can stop the recording here, right? Okay, I'm stopping the recording.